Jeff has said he'll he'll help out with that. Um, and ev everyone else uh, can as well. <laughs> um, all right, and without further ado. A question. Yes. Um, is an accent required because this looks Irish and I am very bad at that accent. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm just going to come straight forward and tell you. <laughs> uh, it is it, it is Irish, but if you are, uh, if, if, if trying to do an Irish accent is going to get in the way of you doing the rest of your stuff, I would say don't, uh, don't do it. Don't, you know, the accent is important as having a good time and, and getting into the character. So. I don't know what character you're playing, so that's... <laughs> All right. All right. So without further ado, Rachel, you want to kick us off? Sure. All right. <clears throat> Mortal of Grace, a play in four acts by Jeff Dunn. Do you want me to? This play takes place in ancient Ireland. Act one, scene one. There is a young man sitting at the grave of his little sister. He is speaking, but we cannot hear him. As the scene begins, we see two fairies, with a name, and Mela, walking through the woods. We should return. Already I can barely remember our path. I remember it well enough, and I tire of seeing the same trees all- They stop, having noticed the young man. He cannot see or hear the fairies, however. What is that? I think- could it be? No. What? I think perhaps it is one of the Deuin. Is it? I would see him more closely. The queen left very strict orders. My mother isn't the here, and you wouldn't. Besides, there's no harm to look. The fairies approach the man, with the name closer, Mela hanging back. As they approach, we hear the man speaking. Mother still worries. She talks less and less each day. And each day I plead with her to come, but she will not. Always for some new reason. To think immortal. The Lord paints them hideous and deformed, but this one is not. With a name, come away. Today it is her legs and how they paint her. Over the next line, with a name studies Yoan, even waving a hand before his face. You worry too much. Yep. Just as yesterday, it was her feet. He cannot see us. But I know the truth of it. Even if she cannot face her own heart, she is alone. I think she barely hears me anymore. Come away, child. You- But the name has reached out and touched Yoan over so, ever so lightly on his head. He thinks it is a fly that he attempts to brush away. Gwith, you mustn't. Gwith and brushes his hair again and giggles. Again, Yoan that's at the annoyance, this time turning his head to look, and then back. This is uses her even more. Oh, hush, it is harmless play. I think that tomorrow I... Gwythenane taps him on the shoulder and jumps back. Yoan is startled. He jumps up and looks around for the source, but he cannot see her. You see? His eyes cannot pierce the grace. Vela stares at her until... Very well, we will return. The fairies begin to head off as the lights fade. Act one, scene two. Again, Yoan is sitting at the gravesite talking, but we cannot hear. Again, the fairies approach. Please! Stop your mithering. I told you, if you do not wish to stay. Don't speak such foolishness. You know I cannot leave you. Gwythenane turns around. She appears to be annoyed, but then suddenly it breaks and she is joyful and hugs Mela. Oh, Mela, I know, and I love you. You know that I love you, do you not? If you loved me, you would not give my heart such grief. Just as we think she might truly be upset, she smiles warmly and hugs with a name back. Come then, I would hear what our doing is saying today. Lights go down as they start to move towards Yoan. Act one, scene three. Again, Yoan is sitting at the gravesite talking silently. Gwythenane is lounging nearby, gazing at him as he speaks plays idly with a delicate pendant that hangs from a silver chain around her neck. They say that the son of the Chiyarna is very sick now. He grows worse as each day passes, and it weighs heavy upon him. His moods are 
black, and he broods in ill humor, even with his Corlair. Mela comes hurriedly on stage. She has been searching for her ward and is distraught. Gwithinane, you foolish child! She does not respond. <clears throat> Gwithinane, heed me! Yoan looks up and around as if he heard something faint when Mela called out. Is he not fair, Mela? He is mortal, child. Mayhap, but a fair one, I think. I have been considering... You should come away from there. Gwithinane doesn't budge, and Mela resigned, asks, What? What have you been considering? That I would speak with him. She stands and walks over to him. She touches his hair, and he runs his hand through it in response. He nearly touches her hand, but she shifts it slightly to avoid his. It is the relaxed gesture of someone who has done this many times before. Please, Gwithinane. This fancy will end poorly. The duina are like a flex of light. You cannot... You worry over everything, Mela. Please, child. For me, if not yourself. Gwithinane stares at Mela for a long moment, then retreats from Eowyn. Do you know why he comes here? I do not. He has a sister. And for some reason I, that I cannot discern, she has been put into the ground in this spot. He comes here to speak to her. Is that not strange? It is their way. When loved ones have died, they take the... What does this mean, died? It means... Perhaps that is an answer I would leave to your mother. Come, the evening descends and we will miss the feast if we tarry. Glyphonane turns to Eowyn before leaving. Fare thee well this evening, my doing. She begins to follow Mela off, but after Mela has exited and before she has, she pauses just slightly. Taking the pendant in both hands, she turns back and says, I'll re return upon the morrow. Yoan's head jerks towards her at these words that he has clearly heard, just as she takes her hands away from the pendant and rushes off stage. Yoan looks about, alarmed, and then lights out. Act One, Scene Four. Again, Yoan is sitting at the gravesite. Griffinane is standing near, watching and listening. She fingers her pendant pensively. Son of the Chierna died four days past, and they say he's fallen into a deep depression. He blames Fergus and further did swear a terrible vengeance upon him. Mother says as if no concern, but my heart lays heavy. I cannot help but fear what may come to pass of such oaths. It is the first time. As he has been speaking, Gwythenane has reached the decision and taken the pendant in both hands again. What is your name? Yoan jumps up, startled and wary. He looks about, trying to find the owner of the voice. Who is there? Come out and stand where I may see. What is your name? I am Eowyn. Where are you? And who are you? Why do you come here and speak to the stone? Lady or no, I will answer nothing more to a nameless shadow. You are most fascinating, Eowyn Duin. You may be at peace, for I would not allow any harm to befall you. Why will you not share your name? What is it that you hide? Is it so important that you know my name? It is. Why? Your voice is like a gentle breeze, and I cannot help but fear that in madness I'm speaking only to the wind. She moves to stand behind him, and then takes off the pendant. Then turn, Eowyn Duin. Eowyn turns around suddenly and sees Gwythinane. He's immediately struck by her beauty and fairy nature. You are... What? Or... What am I? Beautiful. This affects her more than she expects. Her face lights up as she blushes. Then suddenly Mela appears and Gwythinane reacts. Ewan sees this and turns around to see what is there. As he is looking, Gwythinane, feeling embarrassed, puts the pendant back on. When Ewan turns back, he can no longer see her. Lady. My lady? Where are you, my, my lady? Where have you gone? Mela gives her a very stern look, and Gwythinane looks ashamed. She walks to Mela, but then looks angry too. She deliberately turns back, walks over to Ewan, and touches his hair again. He reaches up to brush away the insect that he has always thought it was, and then realizes. He holds his hand on his hair and looks towards where the fairies are. We might almost think that he can see them, 
but as the fairies exit, we see that he cannot, and the lights go out. Act 1, Scene 5. Ewan is near the grave, and there is a basket nearby on the ground. He is not talking to his sister, but rather looking around. Lady? My lady? Gwythenane appears and approaches. Are you about, my lady? She takes off her pendant when he is not looking at her. I am here, my Ewan Duin. So you are. Always. Ewan smiles and fetches the basket. I brought us a loaf and mead. Would you share it? I would. Ewan beers, beams in happiness and starts to take out the food. And this. He, held, he holds out a wooden carving of a flower in bloom. Ideally, it is a solenem dual camera. I, I made it for you, if you would have it. The bloom is like the carving upon your fanier. She points to his ring. He lifts his hand and shows a comparison of the flower with something etched into it. Yes, this flower is the fool. Badu, it is the symbol of my family. It is lovely. Then it is yours. She takes it and smiles. Come, let us see. Do you not wish to speak to your sister this eve? Ewan suddenly looks distraught, guilty. What is it? Have I given offense? Oh, no, my lady. Never th that. It is only... Does your sister think ill of me? No. Nor she, sh nor she would. It is guilt that you see. How could I forget? Tell me of her, your sister. What is she called? <clears throat> when, named after our grandmother. It was four years when she was born. It, and first to hold her new life, even before mother. You hold her close in your heart. Oh, indeed. From that day forward, she was my charge. And no boy or man has ever held happier obligation. I would watch over as she played and tell her stories at the fire. At nights, when the winds would masquerade as wolves or banshee, I would make her laugh until sleep came over us. Mother has told me that you place your beloved in the earth when their spark has faded. Is this what became of her? It is. This winter past, she fell ill when the snows came. Why do you weep? I swore I would always protect my wind. That I would draw arms against dragons or querinet herself before I'd see harm befall her. But still she faded. There are things I know now against which no sword may be brought, no challenge thrown. Sometimes we fall without ever facing. Forgive me, I did not mean. No, my Ewan Duin, what you say I wish to hear. My people do not know sickness. Our light fades only when the will has gone. Then you are eternal. As eternal as the stars. He stares at her, the last of his reservations vanishing as he falls completely in love with this woman who will never fade. Lights out. Act one, scene six. Ewan and Gwythenane are seated near the grave. They are talking to each other, each clearly smitten by the other. Why do you find it so strange that I would feel as you? Because I simply cannot believe it. You are... How can you doubt it? It has been a fortnight already, and have I not come to you every day? You have, although I will never understand why. You are unfair to yourself, and I'll not tolerate such harsh words about my Ewan doing. Will you still not tell me your name? I will not. But why? Names hold power, my love. You do not trust me. With a name leans over and kisses him. If you will not, then I will make a name for you. You shall be my Irene. Irene? I am to be your oath? She is surprised and touched. And what oath is that? That never shall I give you a reason for fear. You shall suffer no pain at my expense. Then let my name be Irene. 
my Ewan Duin. Why do you call me that? Ewan Duin, what does it mean? Duin means mortal. When I say... Then you name me this to remember that I am mortal. Ewan Du... Ewan. Since the moment I first cast my eyes upon you, I saw you only as Ewan. And that is how I see you now. Ewan has gotten quiet and withdrawn. What weighs upon your mind, my love? No matter how I stand in your eyes, we cannot escape the truth. You are timeless, and I... You are what you are. Think upon it no further, for there is nothing else that matters. But... You have given me a name. I would give you a gift in return. Your company is treasure enough for a lifetime. Aside, what is it that your heart does desires most. Ewan's eyes involuntarily look to the grave of his lost sister, then snap back to glistening. There is nothing else. Only you. Like that. Act 1, Scene 7. Glithenane stands next to the grave. Facing her, and rather speechless, is Ewan's sister. She is dressed in dirty clothes and holding Glithenane's pendant, which she re wears around her neck. They are staring at each other as Mela rushes up. She looks in surprise and slight horror at the two, then walks up to the sister and opens her fist to see the pendant. Shocked, she looks like with a name. Oh, child. What have you done? What like, have you done? Lights like dim for just a moment and then come back up on basically the same scene a few moments later as Ewan enters. Irene, I cannot tell you how much- Ewan stops in his tracks as he sees his sister. After a moment, he recovers and rushes to her. Win? Win! But you're... You were... Thanks to Gwythening. You! You've brought my sister back. H how? Will she... You're happy? Happy? I'm happy beyond words. This is a gift beyond imagination. Indeed it is. Only Gwythening can hear her. Then it is a gift for both of us. Ewan embraces her in passion and gratitude as the light thing. Act 1, scene 8. With the name stands alone next to the grave, waiting. No one comes. The <coughs> lights go down, and a moment later come up to her sitting, still waiting. Lights down, and then up, and she is sleeping. Then down, then up, and she is sitting, crying silently. Gwyn enters, her gait slow. Gwyn has clearly been crying, and in the scene, it is clear there is something slightly wrong with her since her resurrection. Gwythene watches her approach and sit. I do not understand. Where is Ewan? Mother has died. Where is Ewan? Why does he not come to me? Mother has... I do not care about that. Where is my Ewan? Why is he not here? The Chierna. What? The cheer and his army came to the valley. Yoan. Where is he? Yoan did not realize they had come. He went to speak with the stonemason, and the cheer and his generals found him. They. He's with the army now. He had only time to return for his woolens. And now he's gone? He asked that I bear you a message. He asked. That I tell you his heart remains here, with his arena. Then here shall I remain too, until his return. I say slowly. Act 1, scene 9. Grithenane sits alone next to the grave, waiting. She holds the wooden flower he gave her. In time, Mela appears. Hello, child. Grithenane cannot hear her. Mela takes out a pendant and holds it in both hands. Hello, child. Gwythenane looks around, trying to find the source of the voice. Mela takes off the pendant, and Gwythenane sees her. There is a moment of excitement, but it fades quickly. Where is your Duin? I do not know. I am told he departed for a thing the Duin name war, but it seems a long time ago, and he has not returned. And the Grace? His sister Wynne wears it now. I do not know what has become of her. And still you wait here, my little Gwythenane. 
No, the power of that name has faded and no longer holds meaning. Today and forevermore, I am Areen. Oh. That shall never give me, that he shall never give me reason for fear. I will suffer no pain at his expense. Areen. But Mela? Yes, my child? I am afraid he will never return. And the pain of my loneliness is like nothing I have ever known. I am here, child. Then how is it that I am still alone? I will stay with you, child. For how long? Until your duene returns. Lights out. Act 1, scene 10. Mela is sitting next to the form that was once with me, now a figure somewhat overgrown with vines and such. Mela sits, waiting, 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 and eventually the lights fade out. Act 2, scene 1. It is a small audience chamber in the dun of Chirna Morgan. He is an old man, frail, and sitting in a large chair. Agif is by the door, having just escorted someone out. I think you're muted, or we can't hear you. Yeah, Jordan, uh, let me see. It says you're reading on our end, um, but we can't hear you. Might be a, the mic in your headphones isn't working maybe. No, still no. Uh, it wants to work. Try again. <laughs> I was talking to you guys before this. There we go. <laughs> Good now? Yeah, now we can hear you. <laughs> All right, let me move this closer then, so. All right. <clears throat> I tire. Okay, there now. are seven more, Pierna. What is your desire? Send them away. They can return. Wynne has burst through the door and into the chamber. Despite simple clothing, she is radiant. Clearly the same woman as before. Check, the am I hearing time. any? Can you hear me? Yep, you're mm -hmm. good. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, she's radiant, clearly the same woman as before, yet at the same time, not. She is the picture of health and beauty. Tierna, I've waited four days and will be delayed no longer. My apologies, Lord. She will be taken away at once. He turns to call out the door. I ask only a simple boon for a woman who has lost everything in your name. Silence, wench. You will not address the Tachirna. He grabs and restrains her. Your dreech is familiar. It should be. You've dismissed me once before. Yes, 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 I did. He gestures, he gestures for the guards outside to hold. In a camp of battle, I dare say. It was. When we fought the bastard, Fergus, may his black heart burn in hell forever. That was the war, the first of so many. And you, you were with child. Suddenly nervous at the clarity of his memory. Your lordship, remember? There's your husband now. There is none, nor has there ever. A frushun off the streets. <laughs> if I am, then it is by your hand. Oh, I think I would remember that night. You, who would take every man of courage or strength and send them to die in your name, you'll take no more from me. It is that what I'm not here. A whore come to exact some began of justice for a lost father. Do you think I care what- It was one... my brother he stole, and I am no fool to seek justice. Only- Brother? <laughs> that was three wars and 15 years past, and you could be no more than- He stops suddenly, realizing that she is not aged at all. He advances to her suddenly, takes her face in a hand, and turns her head back and forth. How is this? 
You have not a day in 15 years. Not a day. If anything, day I say, <clears throat> more fair now than how is this possible? Until I see my Eowyn or his grave, you'll have no answers from my lips. My dear child, when I am done with you, you will scream every truth you have for the barest hope that I let you die. Regine motions, and Aegis drags her off as the lights go out. Act two, scene two. Morgine is in the audience chamber when Egith enters. What news? She no longer heals. Then it is as I thought. She is no shay or fairy. It is the pendant that carries this dryocta. And did you know? Yes. Without this charm, she seems to feel more pain. I took the liberty of discussing her past while they applied the coals to her feet. I have no patience, as I get speak your findings. She claims that through the magic of this amulet, she was risen from death. What? Oh, yes. A gift from the Dehe themselves. Gods, or no, I care not. Have Baven body brought to me here at once. Already they are opening the tomb. Safe with the brown eyes. At once, Chirna. Agus rushes off. When he is gone, Morgan holds up the pendant and stares at it. At last, my son, you will tell me with your own voice what now took you from me, and we will have justice. Like that. Act two, scene three. Morgan and Agus are in the audience chamber, and a boy-sized skeleton is on the table, or a coffin, or a coffin-ish box, or whatever. The lighting is subdued. Morgan gently, ceremoniously, <coughs> places the pendant around the head of the corpse, then stands back. Nothing happens. After a moment, the lights go out and come back up, dimly, and Morgan and Agus are in different positions. Again, the lights go down and return, and now Morgine is leaning down on the table with his son, and Agus is near the door. Again, the lights go down and then return, still dim. Agus is gone, and Morgine is shaking his head in anger and frustration. He then screams in anguish, or just a roar of inhuman anger and grief, and the lights go out. Act two, scene four. Morgine is on the audience chamber when the lights come on, full brightness this time. The sun can be there if there are good props or return to the crypt if not. Morgine is pacing and the door opens. Agus enters. Tell me. Agus is clearly upset. A man who fears that bad news will bode ill for the messenger. She claimed to not know how it happened. She said that when she rose, the, the pendant was upon her and, the, and that was all. He lies. Ask her again, with fire as I told you. No, I... We I, did, as you said. But there can be no more questions now. You dare to tell me what I will or will not be doing she, today. She's dead, Chirna. Gone. Holding out the pendant. Then put this upon her until she wakes, and we shall start anew. When I said she is gone, my lord, that was no idle word. Upon death, her body, entire, turned to ash. It- It what? The ashes themselves then began to glitter. In moments, there was nothing left at all. She is gone. Agus watches Morgaine closely, who is clearly close to a blinding rage. Then unexpectedly, his fury returns, fury turns cold and calm. He puts the pendant around his own neck, stands up straighter than he has before, and says in an icy voice. Then we will just need to find ourselves another fairy. Act two, scene five. Mela is sitting next to the form that was once with a name now heavily overgrown with vines, 
such that Gwipponane herself can no longer be seen at all. The gravestone has fallen over. Keelan enters. He is counting his paces, and we can hear his Scottish accent in sharp contrast to all the others we have heard. 58, 59, I don't believe it. He walks to the gravestone and straightens it. Mela hears him, but has no interest. She cannot see him as there is a tree in the way. Not much to look at, that's for sure. Well, I didn't suppose it would, would be after all this time. Mela is surprised by the unusual accent. She gets up and walks around to the other side of the tree to look at him. Kaylin looks up just as she walks around and... Ah! Oh, you scared me halfway to sky. Who are you and what are you doing in my grand lady's grave? Mela looks behind her, then back at Kaylin. Yeah, you. You can... You pierce the grace? I what? You can see me? I and hear you too. And if you come a bit closer, I can probably smell you. What are you? Ah, 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 I asked you... Me, what I am? I did. Well, that's a new one, that is. I didn't ken how to answer that. My name is Keelan, though. It is nice to meet you. You don't sound too sure. I am not entirely sure. What brings you to this place? You ask a lot of questions for someone who offers nary an answer to mine. You may call me. Nay, let it be. I can see that you're just going to invent something anyway. I wouldn't but I dare not offer you my name. Dylan shrugs, then makes himself comfortable by the grave and starts to clean it up. It's nay matter. You would let it pass. Ha, you're all right. You'll tell me when you're ready, or you won't. Truth be, if I were a young woman in the middle of nowhere, I'd be a wee skittish myself. <laughs> young woman. Are you family? Family. Aye. There's no a great many reasons to be sitting out here in the middle of nowhere, 12 miles from the closest thing you could call a brewery in all of Strainaler. You speak so strangely. Might say the same to- It is not unpleasant though. It has been so many years since any voice has reached my ears that- Years? <laughs> you haven't got that many on you. Fewer than I, I would wager. And I turned only 26 a month past. Oh, I have seen many more seasons than that. Fine. If you will my answer, that's your word. He goes back to cleaning the grave of leaves and twigs. Why do you do this? He looks confused, and she motions to what he is doing. He stares at her a moment, then decides he does care if she knows. This be the grave of my grandlady, or so I'm told. When was your... Grandlady, I. So you are family, then. I am not. Then you're daft. Why do you say this? Why else would you be sitting here? I'm waiting. For what? The return of a doing. A man. Oh, like that, is it? Not a man of mine, but of my lady. We wait together for the turn of Yoen. Yoen's smile drops and he stops to stare at Mila. What did you just say? We wait for Yoen. He scrambles up and backs away quickly. Then he pauses, then steps toward Mela, then back, then forward again. Is this dance? What? He suddenly realizes what he is doing and then kneels down close to her. Your lady, what was her name? Yoen named her Irene, although that was not her name. Irene. He describes her briefly based on the actress. That's your lady. It is. I can't believe it. Mother thought he may but, a, he may but spun a tail, and now you. It is no fable. No. This cannot be. You lie. You cannot be. I would never lie. Prove yourself. He said there was a thing my grandlady was ne'er without. What was it? From the moment my lady gave it to her, Wynne was never without the grace. But to you, you would likely know only this. Mela takes out her pendant and shows it to him. Is that it? One like this, but not this. When my lady bestowed her grace upon your win, it was through her kumla. Kumla? Mela indicates the pendant. What? 
the Kamla is with is that which connects us to on on sale ale, the inner world. That is your grace. <laughs> this is my Kamla, not my grace. I didn't can what this is but a doorway. I am Faye. That is my grace. Then what is grace? One might say it is the key that unlocks this doorway, or perhaps that it is the difference between standing upon the divine lake and immersing yourself within it. So a mortal may only touch the surface, but Faye, like you or I. Me? I'm no Faye. No mortal can perceive me when I am within Ansel El as I am now, but your eyes pierce the grace. If you are not Faye, then you are wholly different from anything I have known in a thousand seasons. Life tap. Act two, scene six. Mela and Kaelin are sitting near the grave, speaking. So you've just stayed here waiting. I gave my word. But Eowyn's dead, sure as I'm breathing. I gave my word. I'd not abandon my lady. But she's dead, or as good as. I gave. I, I, you gave your word. Even were I not bound, where would I hence? I have lost the queen's child. There are no happy arms awaiting me at that hearth or any other. So you're banished. Perhaps, in a sense. Aye, but... There is nothing to come of this discussion but sadness. Can we not speak of other things? I, lady. Tell me of you. I now long for stories unfamiliar. <laughs> well, you come to the right well for that drink. Your whole life is a story nay and uh, nay in I contend. You come from Sky. Oh, I, born and raised. Mida went there when he fled the immortal lord. Chiernam Morgan. If you may left this spot, then... Still the day we wander. There was a time, many seasons past, when two soldiers rested here to sup. They spoke of this immortal lord and his vengeance upon all that lives. And these were his ain soldiers. They were? Well, that's the lord, there can be no doubt. Gilden, that's me dad. He fled when he was still a wee lad. His ma'am, well... Win. I, she went to face the Tierna. She had to face, she had to learn the fate of Eowyn, but ken well the risk of asking. She told him, Galen, that he was to flee north and across the sea if she may return after eight days and nights. And she never returned? Nay, on the 10th night, he fled. Only 12 years old, he made his way to Atrium in Ulster and then across to Govan. He was 17 by then, and he fell in love with Oriana. Uh, That's my ma'am. They settled in Skye when she was heavy with me. And does their light still shine? What? Oh, nay. Mother died two years past, and Dad, well, I nay remember him at all. But you spoke of the things he told you. He died when I was only two years. I know my father's words only through my mother's ears. She would spin yarns about him in the wee hours. I believed every word when I was a lad, then. What kind of stories? Like the day he died. He was impaled on a stake in the smithy. Just careless. She said it took o'er an hour, and there was not she could do but hold his hand. In his last breath, he told her that he loved her. And then, and this is just what she said. He turned to silver ash and was gone. She would embellish like that, she would. What? Your father carried the grace within him. And although I cannot understand how, it has passed to you. Well, I don't care about fairies or see what it matters. Perhaps it matters not at all to you, but to me, it is everything. You see, it is the grace of my lady, the queen's child. And mayhap I was called here to return it. You're suddenly saddened at the thought. Perhaps. Why do you look so sad, lady? I, I do not know. Then I'll just have to bring you something to be happy about, won't I? She begins to smile at him, and they turn to face each other in deeper conversation as the light fades. Act two, scene seven. Morgine is in the audience chamber when the lights rise. He is now a vibrant man in the prime of life, 
and is surrounded by every luxury, which few beautiful women, etc. Next. Keelan enters the chamber. As he walks in, a gem belonging to Morgine begins to glow softly, its brightness growing the closer Keelan gets to it. The Chirna sees it instantly, but is subtle about it. Come in, traveler. What brings you to this hall? I travel upon a quest. Yes, I know this already. A quest as relates to me. Aye, but how... You do not rule for as long as I without coming to value the importance of awareness. Sorry. Uh, my eyes are everywhere, Keelan, son of Gla Glavin, Galvin, <laughs> and ears may listen as you walk to my streets, take an ale with my people, asking your unassuming questions. He stands, then turns slowly around as if on display to Keelan. Am I everything you expected? A bit more, I would say. Page 45, Jordan, at the top. Right. Very first line. All right. <clears throat> and more upon that you'll find. Well, your time for subtlety has gone and passed. You are in search of something in your presence before me, Harold, so that you are ready to claim it. I am, Tierna. Then claim it. Morgan sits with a flourish. What I seek is nothing more than a simple knowing. I ask only to research in the war records of the immortal Lord. Why would you ask this? You are a bard or some vagabond cantor of history? Nay, sir. Then why? <laughs> have you even the knowledge of letters? I didn't. Then why? I would have your reasons before I make my judgment. I seek to learn the fate of a man once in your service. What man is this? And what matter is he to you? He was uncle to my father, and his name was Eowyn. He studied Keelan for a long moment, then... Why does that not surprise me? And you can his faith. I know enough. I will consider your request, and we shall speak again upon the morrow. For tonight, you will be my guest. I have lodgings already in your fine town. <laughs> Not anymore. Until we speak again, you'll be my guest, just as your father's mother was those years ago. Guards, take him to the dungeons. Lights black out as the last line is finishing. In that instant, you should just catch a smile on Keelan's face. Hint, he knew this would happen. The light from the gem blinks out a moment later. Act three. Scene one. Morgine is in his audience chamber. Keelan is brought in, manacled by Delish. Morgine's gem glows at Keelan's presence, and the Lord considers the prisoner for some long moments while he eats. Good morrow, Fairy. How have you fared this past week? Keelan just stares at him. What, have you never seen food nor drink before? But nay, this past week, Baylor Spawn. Baylor Spawn. You'd name me Demon. Tis not why to disparage your host. Keelan coughs again. Morgine studies him for a moment, then turns to Delish. Give him drink. I'll not let this creature's noise interrupt my morning. Delish brings Keelan a goblet. After drinking. Please pardon my inconsiderate suffering. I will come directly to the reason you stand here. You will tell me where I may find your Kamla. The can of the Kamlathan. I know many things that you would secret, and you will tell me more. I didn't think that's... You will obey me. Keelan stands silent, composed. Despite chains, he is calm and in command at the moment. You will answer my questions, you will do my bidding, or you will die in agony like the others before you. So do you confess? You are he they call Fay Bane. Fay Bane? Is that what you name me? This mantle I'll wear with pride. You <laughs> pathetic. A twisted race best cleansed from this world. Weak. Fay Bane. You call me this after three. What, I wonder will you name me once I've ended ten of you? Or a hundred? 
Why do you pour your hatred upon my brow? I've done nothing. Silence. I will have nothing from you but answers. You are wise not to approach me with your trinket. This <laughs> would, have told gone, Jim. <clears throat> would have told me of your presence, visible to my eye or not. But you are here now, and you shall remain until your end. Whether you live as an honored guest or suffer as a punished dog, that is the choice that lies before you now. Well, both sound nice. I'll need to ponder both. Morgine punches him. You would play the fool. See what that countenance that brings. We both know to lay within your grasp to return my son to me. So I ask again, where is your comla? I didn't ken why you care. What would a fourth do that the three uh, oh, what would a fourth do that the three you had now canna? Answer my I'll answer your damn question. When you tell me that. Considers trying to see if there's some trick or if he is missing something. You offer your word. I Very well. I do not have three. When the last two fairies died, their comlick can vanish with them. This. He takes out the pendant and holds it in his hand. Only this one remained. And why do you not just use that then? I believe its power to have faded. It returned the woman win or you claim his grandmother. But no more will it do. Did you not try? Enough. I've answered your question in fullness beyond need. Now tell me, where is your comla? Thinking, I, assessing, and then as if resigned. I gave me word. You'll find me comla hanging round your neck. Morgan lifts it again and stares at it. Then Keelan thinking, thinking. Poor wee Tierna. You can now that she asked the wrong question. You insufferable creature. No more games will I play with you. You shall know, you should tell me all you know by knife and fire. <laughs> you think I jest? You're a worm of a man, Tierna Morgan, with the brains of Toad. You'll nay torture me. A deep fury builds within the Tierna, and we think he is about to kill him, but suddenly Morgan breaks into a loud, Bitter laughter. <laughs> you are a clever creature, Keelan, son of Galvin. You think to win a painless death with your clever tongue. This is nay trickery, immortal toad. Are you so deaf that you nay ken where you stand? Morgan weighs this for a moment, then decides he can afford the luxury of patience. Very well, Fay. What enlightenment should I have sought? Oh, Toad, that is nay how it's to be. Tit for tat, as they say. First you'll answer this. What was the fate of Wynne? You wish to know what became of your grandmother? Aye. This I will share without hesitation. She died no peaceful passing, nor quickly. While she wore the comla, we bathed her in acid and fire. While she screamed and begged for death. And then when the healing gave her her skin anew, we bathed her anew, again and again. And again. Keelan is enraged, but lets little of it show. After a moment, he smiles at what means. And? And what? I asked her fate. You only told me of torture. She died! Well, that I can, but how? That was my question. <laughs> you think this will bring you a semblance of peace? Will you tell me or nay? Why should I care? Well, then once we learned the magic of the comla from her bleeding lips, we took it in our hopes to return my son. Whilst we tried, her feet were covered in burning coals. And that is how she died. And you think to repeat her torture upon my body? Save for the end. For you, you fey abomination, there will be no death, only pain. You have kept your bargain and so do I. What you didn't ask is that what you need most, you didn't can. 
how to use the karma to return your lad. Aye, that's right. You're a fool, Toad, and you cannot what you don't know. You'll nay harm one hair upon me. You think that's so? I know it's so. The other fate didn't tell you what you saw, did they? No. But you knew more than to make twice the same mistake, aye. But they still died. Regain is shaken. He is realizing there are more questions to be asked and is suddenly unsure. They didn't die of pain. They chose to end themselves. And now you can why you'll nay touch me. Because if I will myself to die, and I can, then you die with me. Regine looks down at the pendant, and worry overcomes his face. I don't. Like it or nay, you're bound to me. You lie. You can better than that. I cannot lie. This karma did not fade with your mother. It will not fade now. It did not fade because when she died, it passed to her son. When my dad died, so the Kumla passed to me. But I had no, no son nor daughter. But then all hope is lost. Why well, wouldn't I say that? But this Kumla cannot return the dead. I it cannot, nor could it ever. It was the grace of the Fae, not the Kumla that returned when. What grace is this? The grace in me. Lights out. Act three, scene two. It is an hour later in the audience chamber. Thielen is still manacled, but he is seated by the food and has just finished stuffing his face. Orgeen stands a bit away from the table, impatiently waiting for Thielen to finish. Delish stands by the door. If it is possible for Thielen to let out a mighty belch when the lights come off, he does. Oh, that's nice. Now. Oh, 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 oh. oh. He belches again, or if not possible, takes the last bite of food or swallow of curry. All right, now. You possess this grace that can return Bavian to me. Oh, I, that I have a mortal toad. Controlling his anger. And it would seem we are each at the mercy of the other. What is it you wish of me? I have but one desire. Same as when I came, to walk free to the resting place of my great uncle. You tell me where he rests, and I'll return your lad to you. And you'll do this with nothing but your smile. I'll need the Kumla, of course. You said it was not the Kumla. The grace be the gift, but the Kumla is the tool that's given. And once my son's returned, what of it then? Then he'll wear it. Well and good. You raise my son, and I shall tell you where you may find your own remains. No, no, no. You've given an ample reason for a lack of trust. First, you will tell me the location, and you'll hand me the comma. Only then do I bestow the grace upon your son. I have no reason to trust you. Once I hand you the trinket. I give you my bond. Ne'er will I wear the comma, and further, in this room will I remain until your son is among the living. Why would you do this for me? There is no choice, most noble toad. We are in a stalemate. If I didn't return your boy, you'll ne'er release me, and either I live forever as a prisoner or I die. Better a score of years free than either of those sad endings. And you will swear to this? Aye. Ne'er shall I take the Kumla for myself, nor leave this place until your son breathes again. I swear this. Life out. Act three, scene three. Morgine, Delish, and Keelan are in the audience chamber. The body of Vivian is once again laid out in anticipation of resurrection. Keelan sits impatiently at a table away from the body or Morgine finishes making it presentable. The gem glows near or on Morgine's throne seat and Delish stands by the door. He'll nay care what he looks like when he returns. I care. He puts a finishing touch then. There. We are ready. Tell me. Do you know the town of Craith? Aye, there's a small river there. And, and the body of Yoan was buried in a grave by that river. Do you also recall the stone of Glaith that sits? Aye, I know it. If you walk a thousand paces south of that stone, you will find four graves. Yoan rests in the second closest to the river. And this you swear is the truth? I swear it. Now, raise my son. Without standing, Helen holds out a hand, palm up. Morgine takes off the pendant as he approaches, mm -hmm. 
then holds it out a full step away from Keelan's reach. He then shakes his head in disgust, then stands and takes the pace, his hand still ready to receive. Remember your oath, fay abomination. I, I remember it. Repeat it. I swear that ne'er shall I take this comla for myself, nor leave this place until your son breathes again. Aldean lowers the pendant into his hand, and Keelan regards it, weighs it in his hand. Seemingly lost in thought, he walks away from Morgan and towards the throne. Deelish closes the door in anticipation that he will run. Keelan drifts, he says. Now there's a thing you should ken. When your son returns, he'll nay seem right at first. Fair warned. Also, you should ken that the grace will take time to settle. Meaning? If you kill me right then, he'll likely die but a few hours later. And you'd best be gone by sunrise. Aye, that I will. Helen has stopped next to the throne and turns to face Morgine squarely. And there is one more thing. Enough. No more words. All right. If you didn't want to know. Morgine takes a deep sigh, then. What? Say it and be done. He holds out the pendant by the chain in both hands as he says, You have my word as Fay, that I'll return your bevan to the living, and if Fay can lie nor forsake his oath. But did you nay notice? I'm also human. Keelan quickly puts the pendant over his own head, reaches down and grabs the gem, and then steps away. It is clear that he is disoriented for a moment, but then stands taller and prouder. In that same moment, Morgine screams in rage and rushes where Keelan once was, swinging his arms, trying to grab a man he cannot see. Delish does likewise. Keelan makes his way to the door and opens it. He then steps back towards the center of the room, but away from Morgine and Delish. Go! Secure the dun. Lock every door, every window. Search every nook, every box. Walk arm in arm through every room. Find him or suffer my wrath. Delish runs out. Morgine looks back at his son, and then keens in rage again. Lights go down. Act three, scene four. Morgine sits in his throne chair in the audience chamber. He is clearly waiting for something. Keelan sits perched on a nearby table, a feather in one hand. His other holds the pendant. After a moment, he brushes the feather on Morgine's head, who swaps at it. Keelan then encloses the pendant in his fist and makes a buzzing noise. He gets louder and then touches Morgaine's ear with the feather. Morgaine swats at it, hitting himself in the ear. He grunts in pain just as the door opens and Delish enters. We have searched the dun and found no sign of the Scotsman. I know not how, but I fear. His appearance was no idle misfortune, but a careful plan. Investigate the guards and staff. Likely he was aided from within. It will be done, my lord. In the wake of this treachery, we must presume he has fled. Yes, Tiernan. Already I have assembled a regiment and sent them to the graves at Krekada. Well and good. Delish begins to depart. One matter more. Delish turns around and Morgan mentions motions for him to come close, but he does. That devil was as serpentine as the day is long. We must question the truth in all he spoke. Every deceitful word may have served as decoy and as clever rules to lay hand upon my comma. My lord? Assemble a second regiment at once. Fast of leg and sharp of eye. It shall be done. I will send them after the first. No. He will send them to Lallymore and kill there. Having released the pendant, he muttered. So that's where. But lord, there is nothing... Once they establish, they are to keep unblinking watch upon the bogs, day and night. We will follow with four additional regiments when they are ready, and surround the sleeping lands entire. They will ask what they seek. Say nothing. Only that if anything stirs, anything at all. Yes. Rain holy fire down upon the entire bog. It will be done, Tierna. Delish and exits. After a moment, Keelan once again covers over the pendant with his fist, makes a buzzing noise near Morgine's ear. 
Regain shakes his head and swats the non-existent fly. Then Keelan brushes the feather against his ear and the Chierna slaps himself again. Act three, scene five. Regain paces in the audience chamber. He pours himself a goblet of wine. Behind him, Keelan knocks on a decoration off a shelf or from the wall, and Regain spins around. Seeing it was nothing, he walks to it and restores it. While he is doing that, Keelan drains the goblet and backs away. Orgeen returns to the table. He lifts the goblet to drink, sees that it is empty, and then looks concerned. Finally, he pours more wine into it just as Delish enters. Lord. Putting down the goblet. What news? It is a thing ha- has happened. Word from Kratos? There is none. Nor from Lolly Moore. Then what? A lockbox in the treasury went missing. What? Rogin storms over to Delish, and Keelan takes that moment to empty the goblet again. It was found, Tierna, with almost half the coin remaining. Where? Delish swallows hard. Where? In the foot chest of General Iden. And where, where is the general now? He is at the docks and set to return this evening. Well, he does. Have him appear before me, disarmed. Lord, I would never let anyone approach you bearing steel or... You fathom not the meaning of disarmed. I assume... Oh. There is more. My lord, the men at Lollymore see nothing. Yet we spend precious coin and support. Between the betrayal and the repairs to the West Chambers, Lord, the summer entire has passed. If the Scot was to show himself, he would have done by now. Morgan just stares at Elish. Lord? They will remain at Lollimore. As you command. Elish exits, and Morgan goes back to the table. He takes the goblet to drink, finds it is empty. He then reaches for the pitcher used to fill it and finds it is empty as well. Lights out. Act 3, Scene 6. Morgaine has fallen asleep in his throne chair in the audience chamber. Next to him is a table of food, untouched. He is haggard and, if possible, has aged some. Keelan stands next to him, fist clapped around the pendant. He is speaking to him in softened tones to not wake him. Morgaine responds in his sleep. A mortal toad, your kingdom fails you. Toad. Your people, they laugh when you have gone. They laugh at you. People laugh. No. (laughs) No, you will not laugh at me. (laughs) No. Oh, that's you, sorry. (laughs) No, you will not laugh at me. (laughs) No, no one, no laughter. Kaelin lifts the pendant off entirely and then kicks the chair in his boot. Morgaine jumps up from his chair, but Keelan has already put the pendant back on as he calls out. Guards! Guards! Delish rushes in. He, he, he was here. I saw him. Shaking no, his head. No one is here, my lord. I saw him. It was a dream. You fell asleep. No, no! Keelan touches the back of Morgaine's neck and he jumps at it. He's here. I tell you, he's here. Search the dun. Search it, I tell you. Tierna, Morgaine, friend, it has been four years. The Scotsman is gone. Let him go. Morgaine slumps into his chair. He saw him. I saw him. Rest, my lord. Let sleep soothe your mind. Gaelish turns and starts to leave. Just as he is near the door, Keelan leans his head next to the ear closest to the door, with a hand clasping the pendant. He laughs softly in Morgan's ear. You! You will not laugh at me. You will not laugh at me. I am your lord. I am the immortal toad, and you will not laugh at me. Delish shakes his head in sadness and then exits, quietly closing the door behind him, but not completely enough to latch. He then goes to the table and begins to help himself to Morgan's food. Morgan returns to sit on his throne, muttering to himself, almost a man, crying. I saw him. I know I saw him. The door drifts open with a breeze, and suddenly, Morgan starts to scream again. He's there. I saw him open the door. 
Caitlin studies Morgan and realizes that he is now truly mad. He sighs, a satisfaction tempered with pity, and realizes that his revenge is complete. During the next line, he picks up some food and walks to the now open door. Guards, search the dungeon, search it, the immortal told commands. With a single sad look back, Keelan exits. From off, we hear, Stand down. The Lord needs his rest. I will speak to the generals in his steed. As the last line ends, Felish reaches in and closes the door. Morgan, half asleep on his throne, makes his hand about an imaginary fly, and then slaps himself on the side of the head as the light fails. Act 4, Scene 1. Keelan stands in the bogs of Lullymore, staring at the mummified corpse of Keowen that lies on the ground. He bends over, picks up a hand to look at a ring on the finger. Ugh. Holds his own nose and studies the ring. Well, that's the ring, all right. Either you're Eowyn, or this will be the biggest, smelliest mistake in the history of the Isles. Eowyn bends down and places the pendant over Eowyn's head. He then places his hand on Eowyn's heart, and the lights fade to black. Act 4, Scene 2. We see Wynne's grave, and Mela sitting next to the lump of vines that was once with a name. Keelan and Eowyn enter, but stop away from Mela. Eowyn still does not look overly healthy, but certainly better than the mummified corpse he was before. Is it as you knew it? It is. The trees are bigger. That'll happen over 60 years. 60. Perhaps more. Mela ra- rises and goes to them. When? I came here almost 10 years past now. At the gasp, she recognizes. Yoen. It is good to come home. My lady, look, my lady, your Yoen Duin, he has returned. Did you hear something? Maybe. Mela has approached Keelan and reached towards him. You lovely Duin. You lovely, foolish Duin. There are fairies in these woods. Mela touches Keelan's face, and he brings his hand up to touch hers, even though he cannot see her. You don't say. I met one. I did, and we fell in love. Did you now? She was the most beautiful creature I ever laid eyes upon. Aye. Still holding Mela's hand. Well, you can what they say. And what is that? If you air you find if air you find beauty like that, never let it go. Keelan. You're a wiser man than I. Look here, maybe. Nay wiser. Oh, Keelan. Mela draws her hand away and steps back. And maybe nay look here at that. What do you mean? Mela takes off her pendant. Ewan jumps back in surprise. Nothing. Never mind. Recovering. Irene! Then recognizing that it is not her. Forgive me, lady. I thought you were another. She stares at Keelan a long moment, then looks to Ewan and points at the vine. There she lies, Ewan Duin. You and Duane, how do you... She was my lady before she was yours. I don't understand. This lady was governess to the fairy queen's daughter, to your Irene. And when she now, my Irene, I would go to her whenever she is. Eowyn, it is as the lady. Think not to spare my feelings. I'm glad she's found another life other happiness, and I would not alter it. I merely wish to look upon hey, it. My lady never left this place. She swore to wait upon your return, and that she did. There she rests, and has since you departed. Ewan rushes to the vine and pulls him away. Under, Griffinane is gone. All that remains is the wooden flower that he gave her. He picks it up, looks at it, then at Keelan and Mela, and then, softly weeping, Slowly crumbles to the ground where Gwethanane waited. The lights fade. Act 4, Scene 3. It is some time later. Ewan has stopped weeping and now sits as Gwethanane once did, 
holding the wooden flower. His face is drawn and emotionless, the visage of an empty husk. Keelan and Mela sit near him. How can she be gone? My Irene was eternal, as eternal as the stars. She, she told me. And sometimes even a star may fade. When she gave her grace, I feared... I wish she had never returned my win. It was not that. Faye is Faye, grace or no. She passed on when her will faded, even as her grace carried on. Carried on? Then when lives? Nay, when win is gone. It is hard to imagine. So many years have passed. When did she live a happy life? Did she pass in comfort and family? He pauses, I... just the barest of moments, with a glance to Mela. Holding back tears, he says. Aye, that she did. Then that is some comfort. Did she ever bear a child? She did that too. A strong and kind lad named Galvin. A sparrow. Aye, a sparrow that flew as wind had wanted into the sky. And he lives today. Nay, but he passed in peace, and his son carries on. His son? A merry lad named Keelan. Keelan? Suddenly he realized and points at Keelan as a way of saying, you. I, though nay so merry at this moment. Then you, you carry Irene's grace. I did, but nay longer. Now it rests in you. You, you brought me back in the sleeping lands. In Lollymore, aye, where you fell in battle. And now? Your grace is draped upon you like a cloak, and as you bear the Komla, your strength will return. My strength is gone, gone with my Irene. It, it will not return here. He begins to take off the pendant, but Keelan stops his hand. Oh, you must not do that. Your body is near ready to breathe of its own. Give it time. When you be whole once more, then. Lady? Yes, Yoan Duin? If I die, what becomes of Irene's grace? Layla looks at Keelan, then shakes her head. Rest. We'll talk of this when you wait. Tell me, what becomes of it? Freed of you, it would return to its haven. Not her at a Keelan. Or so I believe. Never afore has the grace been carried by Dewin, but such is how it would be with Faye, and so I think here. Then take it, nephew, and let me shine through your life. I will join my Irene. Once again, he begins to remove the pendant, but this time Mela reaches out and stops him. Gwythanane. That was her name. And when you see her, you tell her that Mela loves her. Her hand falls from Eowyn, and the lights go out as he removes the pendant. He hands it to Keelan and takes a final breath. Act four, scene four. It is moments later. Keelan and Mela are where they were, and the wooden flower lies on the ground. Mela picks it up and plants it such that it stands upright, trying, to, trying out the name now that he knows it. Mela. She nods. Keelan. I thought ne'er were you to share your name with a Duin. Mela puts her pendant back over her head. She stands up and Keelan watches her. She holds out her hand and he rises and takes it. Nor have I. She takes his pendant from him and places it over his head. Come. Come? To where? To meet the queen. She will want to see her child again. It takes him a moment but then he finally understands. And you? Me? I will want to see her child always. Mela takes his hand and leads him off. The next scene can be staged and the lights simply fade as they leave. If not, then the lights should fade down onto the wooden flower alone and then fade to black. Act four, scene five. The lights come up and we see the gravesite as it was in the prior scene, but the wooden flower has bloomed in color. Ideally, the flower should be bathed, framed by a spotlight. The lights then go down again, 
with only a spot remaining on the flower, then it too puts out. And that's the that is lovely. All right. Yeah, that was great, guys. Thank you. Um, let's take a quick, like, let's say two minute break to give everyone kind of time to recover and then we'll start our chat. I actually have to go. Um, yeah, do you, have, do you have any feedback or anything that you'd like to give before you head out? Um, I just thought I really loved it. This is, I grew up hearing stories from my older brother about fairies and um, Gaelic stories and stuff like that. So this was really close to my heart and I appreciate that you wrote this, uh, Jeff. Um, and I'm a fan of your other work because I do a lot of stuff with GBP. Um, so I loved it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, everybody did absolutely. such a great job and I will uh, see you sometime again. Thanks, Sarah. And Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Great job. Thank you. And did someone else say they had to go too? Yeah, I have to go too, but I, I had the same sentiments. Um, my grandpa was from Ireland, so like mm. being able to read that was super cool to me. I, I, I don't know. It's just something I don't get to see very often, and I'm really, really excited to see where you go with this. Thanks. Yeah, me too. I'm trying to love to get it uh, on a stage assuming there's a stage opening at some point one of these hey. someday yeah someday uh, thank you so much for having me everybody did a great job yeah thanks, thanks so much Zach. Yeah, thanks um all right so let's take a uh, two minutes so back at 757 um and then we'll chat a little more thank you too cool. thank you thank you too Okay, do we have everyone back? Yep. Yes. Let me turn my video back on. There we go. All right. Sorry, we're a minute late. I had to feed my cats. Um, <laughs> all right. So, um, any like start like starting off any general feedback? Anyone like to give? Sure. I say, I go. Oh, go ahead. You go. I was just gonna say Jordan A plus for 
fucking the, the Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> well done. That was awesome. <laughs> Joe? Um, yeah. So, um, obviously, like, this was, like, a lot to take in in one sitting. Um, and so I'm kind of, like, scrolling back and, and taking a look at stuff. Um, right off the bat, um, uh, I think the story itself is very interesting and in, in terms of like, it's intriguing. Like I, like I definitely wanted to know what happened. Um, it did feel very um, like, I immediately thought of Game of Thrones. And I know that's like everyone's like Northern Irish, like reference if mm -hmm. you don't have Irish descent in you. But um, like it, it, when I say it sounded like Game of Thrones or felt like it, it's cause the whole thing seemed very episodic to me. Um, and I could totally see it playing out on, on a screen in episodes. As a, as a coherent plot line in a play though, there were points when I got lost, um, even as I was reading it, because of a time jump or a scene break um, that didn't quite make sense. Um, I, I tried to picture myself if I were sitting in the, in the theater observing the whole thing and if I would be able to track everything and I just don't think I could especially in the jump between act one to the rest of the play. Um, um, also, the, the, uh, I'm just trying to think of, I, you know when you word things perfectly in your head and then when you have to say them, they don't come out? Oh, <laughs> I remember. Um, everything, there were a lot of moments where I, I felt like there was a lot of storytelling going on in the sense that like, like we were just getting a lot of plot information. But there weren't a lot of times where where I got an insight into what the character was thinking about a certain thing or how it affected them. There were a couple stage directions that implied how the character should be thinking, which is great. But there, there wasn't a lot of opportunity in the dialogue for character interaction in the sense that we I, I never got to see a lot of the characters live how they would normally live and then experience the heightened circumstance of the play. It was a lot of this is this is these are all the plot points of the play and and we're we we've got a lot of them and so we're going to get them all out to you and it's a, they're good plot points but i never felt like i could relate to any of the characters because um i didn't get to see them experience life mm, okay. if that makes sense of course yeah sure i um i completely agree with everything joe just said i think I'm basically going to elaborate on what you said because that's what I had written down essentially. But I, I, I completely agree that as I was reading it and listening to it, that was what was kind of going through my head is that in a way, the way that the scenes are set up, I almost see it working like, like a television scene or like a filmic type scene. Whereas on stage, I wonder if, um, for example, in um, I think it was act one, like scene four, five, six, seven, was all the same characters, same place, short scene, lights down, jump in time, and then the same characters, same place. And I wonder um, if there could be something, and I don't, I don't personally have like an idea off the top of my head right now, but something more of like a stage construct to show this passage of time, just because like Joe said, otherwise it takes a while for the audience to kind of realize like what's happening, why was there a scene break there? To, to like realize that time has passed, if that makes sense. Plus um, the practicality of like, if you have costume changes between each of those, but then it like each scene's only a couple of lines, like, cause that's how like my brain defaults to like showing a pass that it's a different time, you change the costume. But with them being that short and that quick, I feel like that would pose a problem. I mean, that's also like the director's problem to figure out, but um. I felt like in the pacing in the beginning felt a tad slower like once Keelan was introduced it really hit its stride and like and using sorry I just agree Keelan's a great character yeah and like him with the um as the comedic relief throughout a lot of the moments and like him picking on Morgan um is a lot of fun so I think once he enters it really hit its stride and like it felt really well paced the beginning like the act one felt a little slow because of, I think it's because of that um, 
almost like staccato feeling of those scenes mm -hmm. because it feels like they're talking about different things, but it, we're seeing the same people in the same place discussing very similar subjects. And I think I, it gets repetitive is not the word, but it's it's redundant. Um, yes. There's some condensing that could happen because it's beautiful, but it reminds me of a book that I'm reading right now that has a lot of exposition in it. Mm -hmm. Whereas exposition doesn't always fit just as exposition in plays, if that makes sense. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, uh, my other, I just have one more thing and then I'll let someone else speak. <laughs> um, the other thing that um, I kind of got lost on, I think there was a couple points of fae like Celt celtic fae lore that um were assumed but i'm not familiar with it so i got lost like the fact that when was raised from the dead but then was able to have children and like it was 15 years so like she was living as a mortal fae hybrid but like there there's some things that we like I, I don't know if they better explained or explored a little more um mm -hmm. That was the biggest thing. I was like, how did she have a kid? I thought she was like, it was just, I didn't understand. And I think it's just my lack of knowledge of the lore. Oh, I don't think the lore will help you because I'm not sure that, that <laughs> lore. Well, then we can create lore. Yeah, create lore for the show. Yeah. Uh, um, can I ask if there was, uh, um, what is the reasoning um, behind a four act structure for the play. Why four acts and not two or three? Oh, because there are those those distinct time periods that are there. So act act one is that as, like you were saying, you know, that that's that part where it's a it's a brief period in time where essentially Yoan and Guithanane have fallen in love with each other and it's got this sort of break where he gets drawn off to war. It's a very distinct chunk of the story. And then the next part of it is kind of the next era of Wynne, where she is now, she's alive and alone, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out what it is. And so there's a whole series of things that essentially happen to her that end up being kind of like her little mini story. As a friend of mine put it, you know, Win Win's just like the the least lucky person in the universe. You know, like, well, she dies, and then things really get bad. <laughs> like, that's a fun tagline. Like, that's she, a she great got to die, <laughs> and then then it just then it sucked right after that. <laughs> um, the uh, so that's kind of her part, and it that that's where it starts to you know you you get uh, Keelan coming back, and that's sort of the the closing chapter on, on the win piece of this. And then uh, act three is primarily the piece of revenge that leads into the act four, which is kind of the resolution of the, of the whole thing. I mean, I don't see it as like having multiple um, intermissions or something like that. I think there's an intermission between acts two and three. And from the perspective of an audience, you wouldn't know that there was an act there were act one and act two because it would just be the beginning of you know the first half right maybe more they're... like from a writing standpoint just to kind of separate it for yourself yeah four acts right because there 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 i i thought i felt there were distinctly four eras to the four major moments of the story it was a symphony mm -hmm. there was four, i agree with that the reason I brought it up was because the the uh, uh, in a structure like that um, that extends past two acts to me is reminiscent of Shakespeare, and there are a lot of elements in the play that make me think of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. it, I Keelan felt like Puck from Midsummer. Mm -hmm. I was say major. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, major Midsummer vibes. Yeah, um, when yep. and. Um, uh, or not when, or, or maybe when. Irene, are they the same person? <laughs> Sorry. Guithamine uh, and, um, and Irene are the same person. The, 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 oh when my God, I, I'm an idiot. When Irene is the sister. End? Who dies at the end? 
What's his name? Gwithin hey, dies and Yoan dies. Yoan. Okay, him and him and his <laughs> lover. Right. <laughs> yeah, that felt like Romeo and Juliet to me. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. So okay. so the I bring that up because I think there are a lot of times in the play where a Shakespearean style can be really embraced in the sense that um, the instead of having a linear plot, there are a lot of moments where there can be a plot that goes like this. And we can see moments from act one pop in later when they become relevant, or we can see um, like a going back and forth between um, Keelan being in the, in the um, dungeons talking to Morgan and flipping back to um, maybe uh, who else? Some of his guards' perspectives, or um, what's her what's uh, uh, Mela's perspective on something? Um, that way, we can we can sort of be reminded of who these characters are, get their thoughts on things that are happening, and and be reminded about important pieces of information that will come up later. In the same way that a Shakespeare sort of sort of goes back and forth and back and forth and then converges on one point. I wonder how you what you think I'm when I'm picturing that. And I actually did wonder if I could interleave stuff a little bit more, but my concern in doing that was that jumping back and forth in time would really baffle people. I thought it was a lot of plot to begin with. And Trying to go to earlier, later times in terms of flashbacks could be could be a challenge that way. I don't know. What what do you what do you folks think? That... I think because sorry, I know I'm talking a lot. I think because the time jumps are so vast, it's not like it's not like a week ago, jump to two weeks ahead of then, jump to a month ago, jump to the next day, back five years. It's like 50 years ago, present day. And then maybe like a 10 year somewhere in the middle. There's such big jumps of time that between and the, the, the setting in which a lot of those happens changes. They're, they're so different, like the castle and then the graveyard. Like they're so separate that um, I think you could totally leave that to the director and the set designer and the costume designer and the lighting designer to create those separate environments and make them their job and just say, this is this world, this is this world, we're gonna, and this is this other one, we're gonna jump back and forth between them and then we'll converge at the end, let you know how the story wraps mm -hmm. up. I think that, um, you know, though it's tricky to interweave, I think that interweaving might actually help those time jumps between like two people in the same place, same time, more than a lights down, lights up, because physical time will pass for the audience as they're jumping from like Mela and Gwithinane and Yoan in the graveyard to um, Morgane in, in the palace. And then they're, it, yeah, like you said, it helps keep people in mind. But because um, like reading for Mela, it's like she just disappears for a big chunk in the middle of the play. And a lot of characters just kind of disappear for a while and you almost forget about them by the time they pop back, back up again. And you forget how they're relating to the other story that's going on. And I think that the interweaving would help keep in mind that these are two stories that are related um, and help actually, it, it's tricky, but help enhance that feeling of time passing because time has passed. You've like seen a little bit of another story and then you're like, oh, we're going back to this one, but it's different in a different time. And they don't have to happen separately either. They don't have to be separate scenes. They could all happen simultaneously in one scene. You could have, have a moment 50 years ago on stage at the same time as present day is happening and I think as long and leave it to the light, the lighting designer and the director that we can totally get that we're going back and forth between two separate eras and we're getting relevant information here that's being applied here, that's getting getting feedback over to here. I think an audience would totally get that. And I'm gonna throw in could... here, just kind of dovetailing that mentioning about explaining that Celtic culture with mm -hmm. those with those uh, with those fleshing out the characters, you could weave in the explanations of the Celtic traditions. Like, why is that? Like, for example, when they give the name, and I am to be your oath, 
that left me confused. That where I thought where if you can layer that in the development of a character more with the telling of the why does the naming correlate to this oath statement? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I'm just trying to bring in that explain the Celtic heritage within the fleshing out of these other characters as you bring them back in, in and out through the time zones. Yeah, I think I totally get what you're saying, Jerry. I think, yeah, it's a chance. I feel like there's a lot of, um, I think a lot more could be done with the Fey world or like that, at least like, um, I'm trying to like the development of the love story between um, the two could, if you, if you interwove it, you could have, you could develop that and then it could really feel like this eternal love that um, that they are like fighting to get to each other and th literally through worlds through, um, I think it would like up those stakes more because like right now with it being only in act one, it I think it gets a little lost once we introduce Morgan and Keelan. And I, I think if it's interwoven because that felt like it was meant to be like the heart of the story because even Keelan is trying to help them get back to get get together somehow. I, I think if we see that develop throughout the show, um, we'd be able to identify with that more and be able to root for them a bit more. Yeah, so if that's like the main, if we're still thinking kind of in terms of like a Shakespearean plot, that's like your main thread. And then you've got the subplots like bowing in and out. Um, because yeah, Gwethanine is a great character and she's there and then she's gone for forever. Yeah. Um, there's so much of the play that she's not in, but it's still about her, you know? So I kind of missed her. I kind of wanted to say something that was like not exactly related to all that. Um, but where act one, scene 10, that's the last scene and that act, um, instead of it just showing Mela sitting there next to Gwethanine, like being overgrown, I think you could have a conversation between them showing her starting to lose hope with an aim because it says she loses her will, but we never actually see that. So we could show that as the last scene and show the relationship more between Mela and her as she stands by her waiting for Eon. So that's what I was thinking rather than it just be a silent, just showing Mela next to with an aim, because I feel like Mela would probably still try to talk to her and, you know, keep her spirits up about that. So that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, yeah. More, more of the fight. Yeah. Yeah. This, this yeah the wonderful. truth of it is, this is so rich and there's just so much more that can happen here. You've, you've really written something wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm kind of, as, as you've been describing this, I actually find myself wondering if there isn't a way to sort of pick it up in the middle and turn it around in the sense of like, have the have the play even start with the conversation between Keelan and Mela, and you've got sort of pieces that are going off of that. One is you know what what the resolution is while inter interwoven with uh, with the the past and mm -hmm. showing the love story and what have you. Like that could be sorry integrating from this. Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I was just gonna say, I think that could be really cool because I, I think that the starting pace was a little, it took a little bit to get going, but if you start mm -hmm. off the audience with a question of like, oh, how right. did we get here? Mm -hmm. then, then you get to spend some time doing backstory and telling them how we get there, but you've already drawn them in with like that intense yeah. relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I like, have this like big, beautiful mess of a timeline here. And I think you can really lean into that because to me, a big theme of this is sort of that timelessness where we have this gravestone, but it represents so much to so many different people. And I mean, there's people have talked about, oh, you know, like the, the fourth dimension of time and there's all these different timelines happening at once in real life, but like we're in different vibrations and different frequencies and different dimensions and stuff like that. So if you sort of maybe lean into that as a theme of, you know, there is no sort of linear um, timeline for this play. I mean, you have Morgan who starts out really old and then he's young again, but then he's old again. Um, and you have Wynne who's dead and then she's alive and then she's dead again. And so if all this stuff is kind of cyclical and, and um, happening, not necessarily at once, but 
not in any specific particular order. I think there's a lot more freedom that, yeah, you can pick up in the, in the middle and say, all right, well, what if we start here and then go back in, in flashbacks and things like that. Um, and this, I think Joe mentioned uh, Shakespeare. And he also mentioned it has like a very cinematic feel, which I got that feeling as well. Um, and it's almost, I mean, the storyline is totally different, but it, I got a lot of, uh, it almost felt like, kind of like Pulp Fiction where you have all these stories <laughs> kind of interwoven together, but it's tough for me to say who's like the main character because it feels like everybody has fairly even stage time or, you know, in the cinematic case, screen time. Um, and I think that that also further lends itself to this sort of, it's not necessarily about any one specific story as much as it is about, about the, like this, this location. And if I had to pick a destination, it, to me, it's the sort of the fairy realm that everyone's heading towards. And it's, you know, the, the resistance to, and the, the desire to, pain this this death or this afterlife or the the fey um the fey where, where the fairy queen is yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah um but also i think that there's like somebody said said earlier that um we get to know the character very well in the moment but i there's not a ton of backstory on them um and it the script itself almost feels kind of like a screenplay where there's little moments that would happen very quickly on stage, but that could be done very beautifully on screen. The uh, big thing that comes to mind is like the fly swatting. Uh, right. I think that that's a, a huge uh, motif that's carried through. And on, on film, it, it, with close-up shots and different angles, um, right. perspectives, that could be a, a much bigger series of moments than I think it's, it's likely to come out across on stage and you mentioned having some difficulty getting getting it produced uh i think the length also it's it's not i mean it's it's longer than a one act but i don't know that i'd necessarily put an intermission in so if i'm a a producer looking to put a stage program on this almost feels like a, like a classical symphony and in terms of, what? say that last part again it just broke up you know it almost feels like a like a symphony in classical music oh. and so if i'm at Putting on a, a concert, you know, I might have a, a the symphony, and then I'll have a couple smaller pieces, and that'll fill out my program. Where this kind of feels like that symphony, where I don't know that it's quite long enough to be the full event on its own, and so I think that there's a lot of room to um, expand on these characters who they are. Uh, especially you mentioned that when it was just a, a shorter play, uh, people said they wanted to know these characters more, and I find myself actually feeling the same way after reading through a full full length play I'm, I'm sort of like oh, I, I want to know these characters more um and I think that there's other relationships between the characters that are not mentioned that we don't see as much that like what was the relationship between Wynn and Yoan when Wynn was still alive or their parents or what was Morgan's relationship with his son when his son was alive how did his son die you know what I mean like there's all these uh, little things that it would, I find myself wanting to know more about. Yeah, I, I agree. The Morgan and his son relationship was something that I was missing too, because Morgan's whole like fight is to get his son back. But we really missed what was like the groundwork for that. Um, like, we, I mean, we see the tiny corpse. So like that actually do, do, uh, helps out a lot because we're like, oh, he was a young child. He was taken from him so young. Um, I think that does a lot of work, but there was still some stuff missing that I wish I could see more of and to help understand Morgan a little more. Um, and then he, his, but I thought his fall into madness was so well done and that Keelan yeah. is kind of the yeah. cause of it, but I thought it was so well done. Mm -hmm. um, on the on the concept of uh, Morgan's character in the Sun, I I think that um, an interesting point if you choose to like flesh that out, I think that's something really interesting to explore. Could be his relationship with like the fairy magic through that, because I was getting vibes that like a, a fairy or a person of magic 
killed his son or somehow took his son away from him or was it like a soldier um in my mind it was sickness oh i thought he said something about like he wanted to bring his son to life and then say tell me who took you from me or yeah because I, th I think he i think morgan uh couldn't accept the fact that his son just died he he had to so he had to find a culprit and just, he blames uh, originally uh fergus and waged war against him and killed him and there was no resolution like well i'm gonna find somebody else and they get my revenge no matter what but the truth was it, he just it was just he was chasing nobody there wasn't really anybody who killed his son it was just kids sometimes die and he just couldn't accept that so there had to be a war and that was what drove him into sort of this unending battle against everything i did not get no. that but i love that so i would love to have that like more just flesh. fleshed out a bit Perfect. and then also like his relationship with because i thought it was interesting he went from like he kind of like wanted the, the magic for himself and to help his son but then he also like hates all magical creatures and he like throws slurs at uh he Key, key line, yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of later. So, like, where where does that come from? Like, the wanting to use magic for himself, but also being disgusted of all magical creatures, and like this hate. I think that would be really, really interesting to see a little bit more of. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think that when the advisor towards the end of the play basically calls off the guards and says, "All oh, the, the the king needs rest, or that the Sarna needs his rest." Um, I think there's, you know, now that you mentioned that the, the son was killed from sickness i think there could be really interesting scene where agathe Ag right is the is the advisor yeah. where he um he starts to doubt the the, the uh the morgan you know starts to doubt his sanity a little bit of dude we, you, your son died from sickness he was in a guarded palace tower we all saw him go there was no armies but he still has that sort of dutiful you know, I, I must, I'm part of the government, I have to follow this. And then I think that there's a really interesting storyline there that can be developed even further of his sort of questioning his, his leader to full, basically a full on coup at that point, because he's saying, you know, I'm, we're not going to bring the guards in here. I'm going to be the full liaison. No one's going to talk to him. It's just right. going to go, this form. you know, and, and I think that that's a really interesting storyline that's not as, is well developed he goes from being this loyal servant that will beat people kill people for simply going into the room and speaking to him to all of a sudden he's going to totally cut off the power supply yeah um okay so we have a, only a couple minutes left uh jeff were there any questions that um you had that didn't get covered or um any um, other final thoughts the the one thing that I was curious about also, and I mean, I, I, this is a relatively minor question, but since you asked, and I have one other uh, one question that I could ask, um, in reading it, did you find, because I you know, when I wrote it, I did not write in, well, so it's, some of you have read some of my other stuff, you know, this, this is a very different dialogue style, right? These characters are not speaking like you would expect people to be speaking today. Did you find it okay or, or awkward or uncomfortable the, the speech patterns of it um or did it feel like it worked in the context of the script and, and this the flavor that i was trying to go in that i i didn't really stumble much like just a little bit but after rehearsing i think it would be fine it's just something you kind of have to get used to the more you read it and practice it you get better with and that's just with anything um but i mean obviously the some of the pronunciations, but you put it in there. So it's just more of right. practice and rereading it. And I think getting into the groove of speaking that way. So yeah. I, I think it, it's not that hard to do, but this was the first read through. So there's going to be stumbling anyways. Yeah. Sure. Right. I but think it sure really yeah. words that are in order that we wouldn't put them, you know? Right. Sorry. Um, I, I think it really lends to the world building as well. It really puts us in that we're in like a, a time that it, we're not in a modern time, we're in a either past or timelessness or um, what have you. Um, it really I was just gonna say the same thing, basically. Um, I mean, like it sets the tone very well. You get like 
right away like where what the setting is based on yeah. the structure of the dialogue um so same thing also with like what Alyssa just said like when I started reading the script like initially it was kind of like taken aback but you get it very quickly so I, I didn't find it very hard to follow at all it, it felt very natural um and I just wanted to say also in terms of what we were saying before in terms of like the the multi-layered structure of the the time periods that we go through I would I was very actually impressed by like a sense of scale that you were able to capture um, in like a very intimate story. Uh, like it, it feels like it's a really like large narrative, but it, it's only dealing with a few select couple of characters. Um, and I think as Jordan said, it's a lot of that probably could be attributed to the fact that it does feel also very episodic. I got the Pulp Fiction kind of tone as well, where it's like these intercut stories that all kind of center around a central theme um but yeah i i really kind of dug that a lot um it 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 felt very kind of yeah like like a very large scale story for how mm -hmm. small it is you know yep. um i think sorry are you are you good oh yeah i'm good Okay. I just I just want to throw in my two cents on the dialect. I completely agree. Real production, like full on um, production, they're gonna have a dialect coach. I think you could actually almost do like a, a teeny bit more with the dialogue. And I, I don't know if you know anybody who's Irish or Scottish. Um, I'm reading a book right now called Witches of Eileanan, and they're Scottish in it. And the whole thing, the whole dialogue is all written out like, I did not ken that da, 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 da. like it's all and it took me a couple of pages to get it but it's once you get it it's like reading Pygmalion or something and the first couple of times you read it you're like or the first couple of pages you're like your brain has to readjust but then it's super helpful um just to have those identifiers like in the script itself right. as opposed to needing to fully like rely on yourself for the dialect um like with uh Keelan yeah because Keelan certainly has connected. the the bulk of that in terms of yeah that yeah, way, I really right? like the way that he was written. Like Joe wasn't doing a dialect, but the musicality was still there. Yeah, right. just from the way that you wrote it. Um, I don't know if that's possible with Irish as well as Scottish. I'm not a oh, I think so. yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it is the uh, I and I did actually think about whether I'd try to put some of that in there, um, and I was a little worried for traditional U.S. audiences, especially like some of the some of the things that would feel the same, it would actually not feel as different between the Irish and the Scottish mm. as right now, because Keelan has such obviously written the accent in. And so I ended up making that sort of that command decision of like, okay, I'm gonna write the Irish accents. Let's leave that to the actors to insert the specifics of how they're going to, to pronounce certain words and things like that. And then just try to emphasize it in the Scottish, which I don't know. Mm -hmm right or wrong, I don't know. Yeah, I would say, you know, you can be more uh, committed to those choices. If that's the direction you want to go with the play, then then go for it. I mean, audiences are still listening to Shakespeare and nobody talks like that yeah. nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> right. You need to settle in, like uh, like I think Joe was saying, and, um, and somebody else brought it up too. You know, it, it takes a step to settle in, but I think if you commit to, all right, this is the language it's going to be spoken in, the audience will pick it up, but if it's just kind of tossed in every now and then, or it's not fully committed to it, then I think anytime that comes up, it's going to be, oh, that, that's like a little bump in the road. Um, the only thing for me that I kind of stumbled on was the Dina Ken. Uh, I, I was, I don't, do, me personally, I haven't heard that or wasn't sure what the, how, how it's said or what the rhythm is for that. That is no. I did not Ken. I did not know. Or Ken is no. Yeah, I knew that from watching Outlander. <laughs> I learned that. <laughs> so I don't have anybody in my family who's okay. had an accent. I mean, I had an Irish professor in college. And right. Buffalo, but that's, that's it's, it's particularly doing. Scottish. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. That's where you'll hear it a lot. Um, and it, it it sounds a little a little strange to to say when you're. Speaking in an American accent, and again, uh, you know, if you go to Scottish shop, some going on, you have said, and it and like, oh, oh, yeah, and then it feels more natural. Yeah. Um, Perfect, I think, just like that. Do it, but yeah, 
But then again, if you take the Scottish too far, like I was sort of just deliberately doing, it's almost a little bit difficult to and nobody can what she's saying. You know? saying. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a fine line in Scottish where it's like, it sounds real, but I can still understand it. And That's so true. The first time I saw a show in Scotland, they walked on stage and I was like, I'm going to spend two hours not knowing what they're yeah. saying. Right. <laughs> you, you never realize how many times you can say what until you travel. Yep. <laughs> You adjust them. <laughs> That's also something that the director can reel back. If you have a dialect coach right. and actor right. willing to go full, full on, just right, yeah, un unintelligible Scott, then the oh. director can say, "All right, let's let's dial it back to what American audiences can can understand." Um, and that's something I don't think. I think that that works just fine. Um. Jeff, this is like kind of an, well, it's pretty unrelated, but I wanted to ask before I did it. So my friend, he wanted to read for this, but he was like busy, but I told him a little bit about the play and he was like, oh, I'd love to read that. Can you ask the playwright if you can send it to me still just so I can read it? So is that okay if I do that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I just There's wanted no to make problem. sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. I hope, hopefully uh, he'll enjoy it. And, yeah. Yeah. Spread the word. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, yeah, today, thank you. Yeah, this it, was, it was fun. Fun to be in it. Thank you. It was a, a good opportunity. I, and and just to reiterate from the very beginning, I really appreciate this feedback because I think I think you've made a ton of really great points, and it's got me thinking about different things to do with it. Um, and now that now the question is like, well, which? Because there's a part of me that says, well, let's turning it around. I think uh, you know. For example, starting kind of in the middle and having sort of this V of time that goes out in different directions is, is very compelling. But also, you know, I've started to think uh, based on this conversation about looking at it really more as an episodic kind of thing. You know, what would this look like done as a series of, of short films uh, where you're telling the story? Because that would obviously give you a lot more flexibility to dive into the, the characters that like to the depth of all the things that we'd want to say, you could never fit in two hours on a stage. Yeah. Uh, but in an episodic, you're, you're not limited to that. You can have it as much. And of course, some things are a lot faster to say in, in, uh, in film than on stage too. Right. Got the imagery that you can work with. So. But yeah. hey, folks, thank you so much for, for, for performing it, but also for giving me really good feedback, which I know sometimes it's tough because you're like, oh, I just want to say positive things. but Honestly, as, as a playwright, this is so much more useful um, to get, you know, hey, this this could be worked on. This didn't work as well. It's so valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing your piece with us. And um, yeah, we we I had so much fun. And thank you all for being so giving in your performances and for your feedback. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I know I've said a, a lot, uh, <laughs> but I just I just want to make sure, in case I didn't get uh, communicated, that you do have a really great piece here, and I do want to say thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, I do. I I write myself, and it, it it does take a lot to to open up and and share that and say, hey, what? How can this be better? And right. but I do want to say that you do have a really powerful story here. You do have a really great piece of art um thank you definitely have confidence in this because it's no I mean, you mentioned it hasn't been produced yet but it's it's not because you have a bad story it's not i don't it's it's a very good story yeah it's a beautiful story and i think playing with that that structure is yep. really just going to take it to the next level for sure yeah yeah i'm excited to give it a try and, and see how it goes i'll let you know you know Yes, for oh, sure. Oh, oh. <laughs> Posted, and if there's another version of the script later on, down the line you'd want to hear again, let us know. We're always <laughs> taking submissions, and um, we've had like we'd love to revisit it. So great, yeah, I'd love to do that. So, and oh. if it's, I've got some other ones too, and we'll, we'll continue to talk and, and for uh, sure, yeah, excellent. yeah, we'll 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 look ahead and. Um, yeah, and guys, keep it, keep an eye on the Buffalo Theater Workshop Facebook group. Um, the e if you um, are on our email chains, um, we will be having, I believe we're doing a musical next month. So 
we're going to give that another try. Uh, we haven't done one since our very first reading ever was a musical. So uh, about two, year, two years ago now. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Wow. And uh, we're very excited. And thank you all for joining us. And enjoy the rest of your evenings. Good night. Good night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.